Thank you all for being here. Um, just we're, We'll start in just a few minutes. We all came back from votes, and it was a big rush, and so our ranking member, Mr. Young, is on his way, and we'll wait for him before we actually call the hearing to order. But thank, thank you for your patience. The Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands will now come to order. Thank you, Ranking Member Curtis, for joining me here. The Subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on the impacts of climate change on outdoor recreation. Under Committee Rule 4F, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the Chair and the Ranking Minority Member. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the Clerk by 5 p.m. today. Hearing no objection, so ordered. 
I would also like to ask unanimous consent that Mr. Gianforte of Montana be allowed to join us and participate on the dais. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here today for the Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands Oversight Hearing on Climate Change and Outdoor Recreation. Earlier this Congress, this subcommittee heard testimony from leading scientists about the disproportionate impact climate change is having on our public lands and the role that these lands can play in helping us adapt to climate change. When addressing complex problems such as climate change, it's critical that we consider the impacts to our communities, livelihoods, and economy. Across the country, our public lands support a robust outdoor recreation industry that generates 7.6 million stable, clean American jobs and nearly 900 billion in annual consumer spending and growing. The industry is becoming increasingly vulnerable to climate change, however. Rising temperatures and declining snowpack are leading to shorter seasons for snow sports, negatively impacting the winter tourism economy. Climate change impacts kayaking, rafting, swimming, and surfing as reduced flows and algal blooms plague our lakes, rivers, and beaches. Warmer temperatures are shifting ecosystems, forcing wildlife to alter their behaviors and migration patterns, which impacts hunting. In my home state of New Mexico, rising temperatures and drought cause lower stream levels that are expected to reduce the availability of suitable habitats for Gila trout, for example, by 70% and could drastically reduce sport fishing opportunities. Climate change is impacting our recreational landscapes and national parks. It's shifting the range of the iconic trees in Joshua Tree National Park, disappearing ice and snow in Glacier National Park, and leading to lower water levels in Lake Mead. Landscapes and resources that have existed since time immemorial are disappearing. Unfortunately, the Trump administration's aggressive, aggressive push for energy dominance continues to put our public lands, our health, and our recreational opportunities at risk. This extractive agenda will only degrade our public lands further and exacerbate the impacts of climate change. Over a 10-year period, extraction produced 25% of the U.S.'s total carbon dioxide emissions. A large portion of this extraction occurred on public lands, land that is tied up in leases and locked away from recreation. Contrary to the administration's beliefs, protecting our public lands and addressing climate change does not need to come at the expense of economic development. A 2019 Colorado College poll confirmed that nearly two-thirds of Westerners want their elected officials to address climate change and protect our public lands while only a quarter prefer energy dominance. And nearly 90% of respondents believe outdoor recreation is important to their state's economy. In 2016, the outdoor recreation industry accounted for more of the gross domestic product than mining, oil, and gas extraction combined, with outdoor recreation growing at a faster rate than the overall U.S. economy. In New Mexico, outdoor recreation supports twice as many jobs as the energy and mining industries combined. We cannot continue to abuse our public lands in a way that contributes to the climate problem. Rather, these exceptional resources need to be part of the solution. Conserving public lands protects habitat for wildlife, helping vulnerable species adapt to changing environments, and safeguards the ecosystems which recreational communities rely on. It is time that we prioritize the welfare of the American people over polluting industries. Climate change has already started to impact the ability of Americans to enjoy their public lands. We must start to aggressively address climate change to save the places and recreational opportunities that people need and love. Thank you again to the witnesses for being here today. I look forward to your testimony. I now recognize Ranking Member Curtis for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. A special uh, thank you to our witnesses who have no doubt uh, traveled and sacrificed to be here with us today. I'm filling in uh, today for Ranking Member Don Young, and uh, Madam Chair, rather than take the time, I'd like to submit his statement for the record and move right to our witnesses. Okay. Thank you very much. 
Now I'd like to turn to our panel. Under our committee rules, oral statements are limited to five minutes, but you may submit a longer statement for the record if you choose. The lights in front of you will turn yellow when there is one minute left and then red when time has expired. After the witnesses have testified, members will be given the opportunity to ask questions. I recognize myself for 30 seconds to introduce Mr. Jesse Dubel, a native New Mexican and the executive director of the New Mexico Wildlife Federation. From a young age, Mr. Dubel took advantage of New Mexico's public lands with some of his earliest memories, including following his dad through knee-deep snow in the Carson National Forest in search of mule deer. As someone who has enjoyed public lands recreation for over 30 years, I'm excited to hear how he has seen climate change impact outdoor recreation in our home state of New Mexico. Thank you, Mr. Dubel. You have five minutes. Thank you, Chair Holland, uh, Ranking Member Curtis, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for having me here today. I appreciate the opportunity to share my observations and my experiences. I want to thank you for passing the public lands package and permanently reauthorizing the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Now we must get dedicated full funding so the program can deliver to its full potential of providing parks, wildlife habitat, and outdoor recreation. Full funding is essential certainly for New Mexico, but also for communities across the country. I'm a native New Mexican. I've been hunting, fishing, and camping on public lands in New Mexico for more than 30 years. I've seen firsthand the effects of climate change on our precious wildlife populations, forests, rivers, and streams. The area where I hunted turkeys in the Gila National Forest, both as an adult and a child, used to be thick with birds. But many of these lands are now nearly devoid of turkeys because the springs and streams that they depend on for water have dried up. The diminishing access to water for wildlife extends to every corner of my state. It is critical that we protect wildlife migration corridors and maintain habitat connectivity so animals can move across the landscape in search of water and forage. Climate change threatens wildlife as well as everything we hold dear in New Mexico, the economy, recreation, and our health. I grew up in La Puebla in Rio Arriba County. The median family income there is barely $33,000 a year, far below the state average. Without the nearly $10 billion in outdoor recreation in our state, that number would be far lower. The New Mexico legislature recently established an office of outdoor recreation. Our citizens and elected officials know that a robust outdoor recreation economy is crucial to the success of our state. The benefits of outdoor recreation extend well beyond financial impact. The physical activities enjoyed on New Mexico's public lands are too numerous to list. These outdoor pursuits are an undeniable benefit to the health and well-being of our citizens. I developed a lifelong passion for the outdoors at a very young age. As a six-year-old, I was fortunate to follow my father as we hunted in the woods. Five years later, I had my own turkey tag. I rode with my dad and his hunting partner, Glenn. In those days, there was so much water, we had to contemplate how to get the old two-wheel drive forward across the fast-flowing creeks. The mule deer, elk, antelope, and birds of prey we spotted were beyond count. My dad died four years ago, but Glenn and I have carried on the tradition of visiting this very special place. Unfortunately, now, where we used to camp beside a running creek that was at times hard to cross, is a dry stream bed. On my last visit, which was just two weeks ago, I had to hike five miles upstream, right, to, to find water. If there's no water, there are no turkeys. The population due to lack of water is a small fraction compared to what it was 20 years ago. If Glenn and I want to carry on our family tradition, we're going to have to find a new place to hunt turkeys. The presence of water at numerous remote locations we used to backpack to is no longer a given. It's not feasible to carry water so far, so I dearly miss these places. I have a third grader who will soon start summer vacation. If this year is like the previous 10, many of our forests will close due to high fire danger. The threat is real, the closures are necessary, but heartbreaking nonetheless. The damage to our forests from climate change is real. I've gathered pinon nuts on some of the same slopes as indigenous people have for millennia. The tradition of gathering this crop is dying along with the pinon trees in the forest. And this will be acute on wildlife populations. 
Streams that provide habitat for native trout species like Rio Grande cutthroats and Gila trout are going dry. New Mexico's largest reservoir dropped to an all-time low water level last year at just 3% of its capacity. Boat ramps at lakes across the state experienced months of closures. Thanks to public lands, opportunities for outdoor recreation in New Mexico are tremendous. They must continue to support our state's economy and our quality of life. But opportunities for me and my fellow New Mexicans to share with our children what our parents shared with us are rapidly disappearing. Climate change is whittling away at our ability to hunt, fish, camp, and otherwise enjoy the bountiful benefits of our public lands. The dollars lost by the decrease of outdoor activities will pale in comparison to the negative effects on an active outdoor lifestyle. We must act to ensure future generations have the ability to experience public lands that are wild, sustainable, and healing. I appreciate you the, the opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Mr. Jubal. The chair now recognizes Ms. Callan Chithluk Sifsoff, a 2012 Winter Olympian, Park City Snowboard Team Development Coach, Indigenous and Environmental Activist, and Yupik Alaskan. You have five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you very much, Chairman, uh, Chairwoman Halland, and members of the subcommittee for natural, National Parks, Forest, and Public Lands. My name is Callan Trifluk Sifsoff. I was a member of the United States Snowboard Team from 2005 to 2014, uh, and was honored to represent the United States at the Vancouver Olympics in 2010. Um, I was also the first Alaskan native uh, to ever make an Olympic snowboard team, or Olympic team in general. Um, and uh, I've, since retirement, worked as a, a U.S. team development coach uh, for development camps uh, annually, as well as a private uh, snowboard coach um, internationally. Uh, and my uh, experiences have been uh, to further the Olympic dreams of young people, uh, and that's been my experience in the last three years. Uh, but I grew up in the Yupik village of Aleknagik, which is on the Bering Sea coast in the Woodtikchik State Park. Uh, these communities, which make up 82% of Alaska, um, are rural and maintain deep connection to the environment, uh, and that's an integral piece to our culture um, and really does uh, trickle to every facet of, of life in rural communities. Um, this is also shared uh, with communities surrounding uh, the Arctic Refuge. And, um, a warming climate in those areas of rural Alaska, um, it's the front line of climate change and, uh, and seriously threatens the viability of life and culture in those areas. Um, but my experiences as a Yupik Alaskan um, and an Olympic snowboarder, snowboarder have been varied and, and very diff different. <clears throat> but there's been a common thread and that's been an observation of climate change on public lands and on a global scale. Uh, today, I hope to bring a broader understanding of the impacts that I've witnessed in my lifetime and how uh, that will continue to impact our public lands unless we make a stance and uh, stop fossil fuel extraction. At the age of 13, I left Aleknagik and I relocated to Gerdved, Alaska, where my Olympic dream took flight. Um, once uh, I began competing at Alyeska Ski Resort, um, which is 500 miles away from my indigenous homeland, I began to see the repercussions of climate change uh, in a different location. Uh, Alyeska Ski Resort has uh, just been put up for sale, um, and that's due to um, poor economics in the last uh, five years due st strictly to climate change. Um, throughout my career, I've observed a diminishing snowpack globally and nationally, as well as in my home state of Alaska and it uh, directly impacts the environmental feasibility and economics of the sport in general, as well as winter sports. When I competed in the 2010 Vancouver Olympics, snow had to be helicoptered up to the venues in order to create the competition. So without those uh, actions and the, the final two weeks uh, leading up to the Olympics, um, the Olympics would not have been able to be put on. And the same can be said for Sochi and uh, 2018, uh, the Olympics that we just saw was 98% man-made snow. It's clear that depending on snowmaking or even snow farming, uh, these new technologies to mitigate the effects of a loss of snow pack 
Um, these are now critical in order for ski resorts. Almost every ski resort in the nation or the world needs these tools in order to keep snow on the ground. Um, nationwide, the snow sports economy generates 72 billion and provides 695,000 jobs per year. Um, this is especially important uh, because these, uh, these things that we can witness in terms of climate are not simply just emotional. Uh, these things are important uh, to me and the passions that people have in the outdoor world, but um, economically they are hugely impactful. Um, I've shaped my career on public lands uh, in Alaska nationwide, and um, growing up in Alaska, we understand that we have uh, 220 million acres of public lands, and those do need to be protected, uh, including the iconic uh, Ar Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Um, this is not the time to open up uh, areas like the Arctic Refuge to fossil fuel development right now. Um, it would not only irreversibly destroy the landscapes, um, but also uh, recreation access for, for hundreds of thousands of people. Um, it would also significantly add to the climate crisis at a time when we already know that it's imperative we stop fossil fuel development in order to curb climate change. <clears throat> I, speak to to you, I speak to you today as a 30-year-old who in a very short lifetime has witnessed climate change firsthand on many different scales. And uh, I ask you to take climate change head on because the future of the culture uh, of indigenous places in Alaska as well as the careers and passions of every person in our nation are in the balance. And I uh, thank, thank you guys for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. I thank you for your testimony. The chair now recognizes Ms. Hillary Hutchison, a native Montanan and avid fly fisher. Ms. Hutchison was raised in Columbia Falls, Montana, just outside Glacier National Park, and started her career as a teenage fly fishing guide in West Glacier, Montana. She now owns and runs Larry's Fly and Supply Shop in her hometown of Columbia Falls and is a climate activist with Protect Our Winters. Thank you, Ms. Hutchison. You have five minutes. Thank you and good afternoon, Chair Holland and members of the Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests and Public Lands. My name is Hillary Hutchison. I'm a fly fishing guide from Columbia Falls, Montana, located at the west entrance of Glacier National Park, known as America's Crown Jewel. I got my start working at the oldest and largest outfit in the region 25 years ago. I was washing boats and backing up boat trailers and making the sandwiches and babysitting the company owner's kids. I also own and operate my own fishing retail store in my hometown, as you mentioned, Larry's Fly and Supply. It's short for Hillary. Hi, Larry. Um, <laughs> and I am the mother of two girls in high school. My oldest daughter's first job was also making sandwiches at the same guiding company where I started. My children are the latest to prove that for generations my family has lived, worked, and been financially dependent on our nation's great public lands. My grandfather was a skilled alpinist and search and rescue leader at Mount Rainier National Park. My parents were both National Park employees, first at Mount Rainier, then Crater Lake, and then raising their family in Glacier National Park. My parents taught us to explore the rivers, the forests, and mountains, and we quickly became capable and confident and comfortable in the outdoors. My sister and I picked up fly fishing in junior high together. We both began guiding whitewater raft trips in high school, and then we started taking fly fishing clients soon after that. Now I run rivers from the spring through fall, including multi-day whitewater wilderness fishing trips in Montana's Bob Marshall Wilderness and in Idaho's Frank Church Wilderness. My sister is the executive director of a fly fishing program for women with breast cancer called Casting for Recovery. My guests come from all over the world, drawn by awe-inspiring elements found in public lands, including Glacier's distinctive competitive edge and that is a vibrant and intact ecosystem. I'm sure you've all seen those famous photos of our park's diminishing glaciers. I have watched the disappearing act firsthand, and I've had to explain it to guests on my boat. There were 150 glaciers when the park opened in 1910, 50 when I first started guiding, 35 when I had my children, and today there are 26. We're expected to have no more left in just over a decade. I am most concerned with the direct importance of our glaciers to that intact ecosystem, our competitive edge. 
When the glaciers are gone from the headwaters of a basin, there's no longer a source of water for late in the season when the soil moisture is low and the snowpack has melted. What's supposed to happen is that the glacial ice provides the vital source of water for our fishable rivers. This water is home to species of concern, such as the federally protected bull trout, which need cold, clean water. As the glaciers retreat, the volume of water goes down and the temperature goes up, putting different species at risk. That can destabilize this ecosystem. Biologists are analyzing how rain events that are happening when it should actually be snowing can scour bull trout nests and wipe out future generations. Non-native rainbow trout that are hardier in warming waters are now breeding with our native cutthroat, threatening degradation of our competitive edge again. I do care about these at-risk species like our beloved native West Slope cutthroat trout, but I mostly care about the humans. The humans who will lose their jobs, their livelihood, and their fundamental happiness as this system collapses. These are the people that I employ, their families, their neighbors, their friends, and the outdoor industry dependent communities just like mine all across this country. Today, the state of Montana imposes something called the hoot owl restrictions, which requires anglers to be off the water by 2 p.m. when the river temperatures rise to 73 degrees for three consecutive days. Catching trout in water that is too warm and less oxygenated causes excessive stress to fish. To be clear, hoot owl is a government regulation adopted as a result of rising temperatures from a changing climate directly impacting fishing. On rivers that hover below that 73 degree threshold, guides are self-imposing the rule now as an act of vigilance to protect our fisheries, even at our own economic expense. I feel fortunate to guide on th three rivers that are protected under the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. In 1968, U.S. Congress enacted the law to preserve certain rivers with outstanding natural, cultural, and recreational values for the enjoyment of present and future generations. So I'm so grateful to Congress 50 years ago for this action, and I'm confident that this Congress will remember that legal commitment that was made and uphold it by addressing climate change. When Congress instructed protection of these important rivers, it helped enable communities to drive this outdoor economy that's now a thriving $887 billion economy nationwide. Since Congress went to such lengths to create this safeguard, it clearly intended for future leaders to maintain such a high level of care and attention. Today, I wish these realities that we're hoping for, that you'll hear today at this, this table, were just in my imagination. Um, now I just want to imagine that Montana's outdoor recreation economy and the lifeblood of my community can be saved through climate action. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hutchison. The chair now recognizes Mr. Gianforte for 30 seconds to introduce Mr. Mark Lambrecht. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me to introduce my good friend, Mark Lambrecht. Uh, Mark serves as the Director of Government Affairs at the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, an organization dedicated to supporting hunting, habitat conservation, and public access to our federal lands. I've worked with Mark and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation on the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and I proudly pressed Google recently when they tried to ban the group's hunting ads with the ridiculous notion that hunting is animal cruelty. The Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation all, also engages in habitat enhancements. Its leaders and members understand the need for active forest management. As we face changing climate, we need to do more to manage our forests. That's one reason I'm a proud sponsor of the Resilient Federal Forest Act. This bill makes common sense reforms. I look forward to Mark's testimony so we can learn more about better managing our forests and enhancing wildlife habitat. Thank you for being here, Mark, and uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Congressman Gianforte. I appreciate the introduction. I appreciate working with you and all of your support. Uh, Chairman Ho Chairwoman Howland and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this hearing. As the Congressman said, my name is Mark Lambrecht. I'm Director of Government Affairs for the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. I'd like to talk to you today about the impacts of climate change on western forests and what that means for elk. Increasing temperatures have contributed to outbreaks of forest insects and diseases that have deteriorated forest health, killed an unprecedented number of trees, and caused larger, more frequent, and more intense wildfires. These conditions have made western forest carbon emitters rather than the carbon sinks they should be. They have also significantly impacted elk habitat on public lands, pushing herds to adjacent private lands where they cause problems for landowners and are often unavailable to the public for hunting and viewing. Recent research from the former climate change advisor to the Forest Service demonstrates forests in Arizona, Colorado, Montana, Nevada, Utah, and Wyoming are now 
emitting carbon, not just from wildfires, but from trees killed by insects and disease. Tree mortality is more prevalent than ever before because of drought and heat. In Montana, forests are sending 20 million tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere each year. Since 2005, timber mortality has significantly outpaced timber growth in western forests. A 2015 Forest Service inventory of 11, 11 western state forests estimated over 6.3 billion standing dead trees, a 20% increase from 2010. Montana led the way with over 1.2 billion dead trees, followed closely by Colorado, Idaho, and Wyoming. The trend has continued with an additional 146 million trees killed in the region between 2015 and 2017, with the greatest mortality measured in Colorado, Montana, Idaho, and California. Net timber growth in Idaho declined by 39%, while timber mortality increased by 225% between 1991 and 2016. Montana forest experienced a 91% reduction in net growth and a 263% increase in mortality during the same period. Because of conditions like these in western forests, the Forest Service estimates nearly 70% of federal forests are in need of restoration to be accomplished through timber harvest, prescribed fire, planting, and seeding. More acres have burned than were harvested for timber since the mid-1990s, and that trend continues. Elk distribution and reproduction is also negatively impacted by these forest conditions. Elk have three basic habitat requirements, food, water, and cover. Federal forests dominated by dead and dying trees that are susceptible to catastrophic wildfire do not provide the diverse habitat and nutrition elk need to thrive. Instead, long-term fire suppression, lack of active forest management, and insects and diseases have deteriorated tens of millions of acres of habitat. This has a significant impact on elk herd distribution, nutrition, and reproduction. RMEF and 26 partners, including the Forest Service, Boone and Crockett Club, Wildlife Society, and Warehouser, and others, recently completed significant large-scale spatial analysis of elk distribution in western Washington and Oregon on over 29 million acres of public and private forest land. Researchers tracked 173 cow elk that were captured and collared in eight locations. 13 radio telemetry data sets provided a picture of their preferred habitat during critical summer months. This slide shows a very interesting picture of where collared elk in the study were primarily distributed. Radio telemetry tracked their locations, demonstrating their preference for the open area of a perpetual clear-cut power line with adjacent cover. Now, RMF is not suggesting forests should be managed for perpetual linear clear-cuts, but they should be managed for ample openings with adjacent cover. Researchers also tested captive elk for nutritional values and pregnancy rates. The research provided significant evidence that elk mostly avoided areas with low forage nutrition, and elk found in areas with low forage nutrition had lower pregnancy rates and lower autumn body fat levels. The study concluded elk overwhelmingly prefer areas with early seral habitat, far from roads and close to cover forest edges. Early for seral forests are ecosystems with rich biodiversity characterized by large live trees and snags, downed logs, and openings with nutritious forage. RMEF supported additional research published last year by the Montana Department of Fish, Wildlife, Parks, and the Forest Service that reached similar conclusions. The distribution and availability of high-quality nutrition forage provided by landscape disturbances, including prescribed fire, forest thinning, and openings, strongly influenced elk distribution, particularly for cow elk. Additional research conducted by the University of Wyoming determined elk avoid beetle-killed forests because of the energy required to spend to walk over downed trees and the lack of cool areas available in summer months. Despite the increasing temperatures and deteriorating forest conditions, there is much we can do to make our forests more resilient and productive for elk and other wildlife. We look forward to working with members of Congress on legislation that will lead to agreements between public and private forest managers that will result in active forest management to improve habitat conditions for elk and other wildlife. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lambrick. The chair now recognizes Mr. Fred Ferguson, Vice President of Government and Industry Relations for Vista Outdoors. Welcome. Chairman Holland, Vice Leader Curtis, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for allowing me to participate today. My name is Fred Ferguson, and I am Vice President of Government and Industry Relations for Vista Outdoor. Vista Outdoor is a consumer products company with over 40 brands that operate in various hunting, 
outdoor recreation, and lifestyle markets. Among the most notable brands are Federal and CCI Ammunition, which collectively are the world's largest commercial ammunition manufacturers, Camelback, the inventor of the hands-free hydration category, and Bell Helmets, a staple among outdoor enthusiasts of many types. The slogan of Vista is to bring the world outside. This mantra drives us to develop the very best products, but is also the bedrock of the Vista culture. Each of our nearly 5,000 employees cares deeply about the outdoors and conserving the places we love for our kids and our grandkids. As a company, we believe the climate is changing and we believe that humans are having an impact. To fulfill our mission and to ensure the next generation has access to the outdoors, we believe that individuals, industry, and government must come together to debate, develop, and deliver solutions in the face of these challenges. To begin, we believe more should be done at the individual level to reduce waste, pollution, and harmful impacts to the environment. I am proud to join Representative Curtis in the Clean Air Challenge. At Vista, we are also empowering individuals through workplace flexibility, video conferencing technology, and widely used water refilling stations. We would also like to thank the subcommittee for ditching disposable. The average American drinks 18 disposable plastic waters, bottles of water per month. Camelback has long been a leader in eliminating single-use plastic bottles. In fact, their ditch disposable campaign has spared 10 million reusable plastic bottles from our landfills and waterways. Second, we believe that industry needs to lead by example. At Vista, we are proud of our environmental record. Reducing our environmental footprint is a corporate goal and we have a team putting words into action. Currently, our teams are advancing more than 20 different environmental initiatives. For example, many locations have reduced power usage through the retrofitting of various lighting systems. At our largest manufacturing facility, 97% of the materials used in production are recycled or reused. In another site, the majority of electricity is generated from renewable hydropower. We also stress environmental responsibility in our supply chain and with our international partners because we believe any serious conversation about emissions must also be global. We believe all companies, but especially those in the outdoor recreation space, have a responsibility to behave in an environmentally conscious way. Finally, government must display leadership and develop realistic, bipartisan solutions that address sustainability and resiliency in the face of a changing climate. In the interest of time, I will summarize the key policy princi principles included in my written statement. To begin, consensus must start with the principle that multiple use requires multiple management. We believe that federal lands should stay in federal hands, but we also believe that a one-size-fits-all management directive for 660 million acres of federal land is a losing strategy. Congress should enact laws that empower local field offices to promote healthy, ecosystem, e healthy ecosystems, climate change resiliency, and outdoor recreation. Second, hunting, wildlife habitat, and a healthy climate are linked. The hunting industry answered the nation's call to save wildlife in their habitat. As a result, the hunting industry has paid more than $12 billion in federal excise taxes through the Pittman-Robertson Wildlife Restoration Fund. Pittman-Robertson is an 11% excise tax paid on all firearm, ammunition, and archery products. Since Vista's inception in 2015, our company has proudly been the largest payer into the fund, with an average of $80 million per year. Through this program, 76 million acres of habitat have been created, improved, and restored. Healthy forests, wetlands, grasslands, deserts, and sage flats supported by the Pittman-Robertson Fund function as an engine for carbon sequestration. Congressional support for the hunting community and recognition of our contributions to healthy ecosystems must be part of climate change consensus. Finally, it is critical that our forests are properly managed and that all management tools are on the table. Enactment of the so-called wildfire fix solves the budget, con uh, budget crisis, but Congress must also pass a forest, forest management bill that restores healthy forests and turns the tide on catastrophic wildfires that are becoming all too common in our country. Thank you for being here, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Ferguson. Thank you all for your valuable testimony.
The chair will now recognize members for questions and under committee rule 3D, each member will be recognized for five minutes. And I would first like to recognize Mr. Case for five minutes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think listening to all of your testimony, what strikes me the most is that you're all in agreement on the impacts of climate change in some way, shape or form on our public lands and on our various forms of recreation on our public lands, which I find very encouraging. We're all on the same page on that, uh, whether it be hunting or fishing or snowboarding or, or hiking or other forms of recreation. Uh, uh, clearly, you all feel that something has changed in your lifetimes. And I feel the same way. The only reluctance I have with your testimony is that nobody really talked too much about the oceans. Now, I know uh, that uh, four out of the five of you, as I think I understand, uh, um, live kind of inland. But uh, Ms. Chaithlik uh, Sifsoff, you're in California now, is that right? Yes, that's correct. I just moved to Berkeley, California. Okay, and are you, are you converting your snowboarding into surfing and recreating in the ocean? I certainly am. I'm uh, enjoying the summer weather over there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, in all seriousness, um, our oceans um, may not be technically public lands in the way that we think about them, but they are public resources and they are just as impacted by climate change as anywhere else with uh, coastal, er coastal erosion and, and beaches um, eroding and um, frankly fishing, ocean fishing mm -hmm. uh, declining and changing. We had earlier testimony in this committee on that. Uh, we certainly have seen, uh, you know, surf, surf breaks are very subtle and so little changes in, uh, in sea level can, can impact where, where, the, where the breaks are and how they break and when they break and, and you know, people like my constituents are very sensitive to that kind of stuff. Um, so I just want to put in a plug for the oceans as we talk about this. But you know, I, I want to go back to a, maybe a, a, a broader question, which is, um, what, um, what, is the, what, is the, what do you believe the fix is? In other words, uh, some of you have done very specific comments, but if we're seeing this uh, impact on our public lands generally and recreation you know, in particular, do you have like one or two bullet points about what you think we should do given what we all believe, what we seem to all believe is, is happening from a, from a climate change perspective? Are there broad changes to um, the way that we manage our public lands to enhance, uh, to enhance recreation, uh, to enhance the, the basic survival of our public lands? Can I just kind of go right down the, the row and ask you for a couple of bullets on, if you had your wish, what, what, what would we change public, I'll just start, with you, sir. Uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, um, Chair Holland, members of the subcommittee, I feel like it's critical that we fully fund the Land and Water Conservation Fund. We recognize that a lot of the impacts that we're feeling as a result of climate change are a result of extractive industry. And we understand that extractive industry has to exist for our modern lifestyle. But the fact that we have not fully funded the Land and Water Conservation Fund so public lands can be protected and can, can aid in carbon sequestration instead of just extraction would be my first step and, and one that I think is critical. Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm going to keep going here. Yeah, quickly, uh, just to actually answer your previous question about marine life, uh, that's one that I can speak to more directly. Um, living in the Bay Area, there's been a... Uh, a big uh, phenon phenomenon happening in the last couple months. There's been an unprecedented amount of gray whales traveling into the Bay Area, and they're juvenile gray whales, and uh, about 50% of them have died uh, while being in there. Uh, and I work currently on a, a ferry boat in the Bay uh, as a part-time job, and, um, and I'm witness to dead whales literally uh, about every two weeks right now. Um, what should we do? Um, well, the, the cause of it is because of a warming uh, ocean, and these whales have a lack of food uh, because of a changing climate in the ocean. Um, and so the, the, the reality is that what we need to do is stop fossil fuel extraction right okay. now. And Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Just 20 minutes each because I'm running out of time. Sorry. Thanks for the question. So as I think 20 seconds, by the way, not 20 yeah, minutes. 20 minutes. I don't, I don't I want to get in trouble. Just run with it. <sighs> you know, you guys, public lands do such a great job of keeping carbon in the ground. So keeping as many wild lands wild as we can is an automatic way of kind of keeping, you know, the carbon where it is, which is super key. Okay. Um, that would be my biggest bullet point. Let me let me go down. What I got two more. Thanks. Thank you, Congressman Case, for the question. I would ask you to take a bird's eye look at a forest watershed and through actively managing the forest to reduce, reduce the trends of deteriorated forest conditions from insects and diseases, we could use a number of different treatments, prescribed burning, 
openings, thinning of the forest to try to reverse that trend. Okay. That would be the bullet point. There. Thanks. Bipartisanship. You know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when LWCF was controversial um, through bipartisanship, through discussions of different programs such as the stateside program, you know, the body was able to come together to get that done. Okay. That's a great way, great place to end. Thank you very much. The chair, the chair, the chair now recognizes Mr. Heiss for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and I appreciate the, each of the panelists for being here. But I'm going to take a little bit of a different angle here. Uh, from my best counts, this is now the 15th hearing that we've had in natural resources on climate change, and I think this either the fourth or fifth in this committee uh, and this subcommittee. And I'm, uh, although we've, we've had some good debate, some good discussion, I think we've moved some, some positive things forward. I, at the same time, worry that we're not really addressing some of the issues of our park system and coming to some reasoned uh, solutions to some of those issues. Uh, and, you know, the, the issue yet again that we're dealing with here, climate change, is, is one filled with emotion and a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, feelings, I get that, but we've had even some tell us that we've only got 12 years left and this whole thing's gonna come to an end. Uh, we have a doomsday clock out there ticking and they added climate change to their prediction uh, several years back and I don't know if any of you have looked at the doomsday clock, but it's now two minutes till midnight. So, I mean, this is uh, obviously from, at least from the opinion of many, a, an extremely critical issue that needs to be addressed within two minutes to 12 years. Uh, and uh, who knows what it is, but we have one of our colleagues who, who introduced uh, some time back the Green New Deal, and uh, which is going to supposedly address this issue and address multiple problems facing our country. We have 93 co-sponsors in the Democratic Party, including, I believe, 10 in resources, five on this subcommittee right here. And uh, from that perspective, I would likewise agree that it's a critical time. I believe the American people need to know where their representatives stand on the Green New Deal. Uh, I've led the way on a discharge petition. Uh, we, it's doing quite well. Somewhere in the ballpark of 100 or so have signed that discharge in just a short period of time. But from my best uh, count, most recently looking, not a single Democrat has signed on to it. And we have 93 co-sponsors within the Democratic Party, 93. And not a single one are saying we want to vote on it, and yet the hour is critical. We've got to deal with this issue right now, and this is the, the issue that the Democratic Party has put together. And I, I just uh, want to bring that to light that now is the time. We're going to have another vote series here in just a few months. I want to encourage my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to uh, face the issue with the urgency that you say it is and to sign the discharge petition. It's, it's on the floor of the House. I think uh, this is a time the American people know where every representative here stands on that issue. And with that, I'm uh, going to yield the remainder of my time to my good friend, Mr. West. Thank the gentleman for yielding. I thank the witnesses for uh, being here today to address this important uh, subject. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a turkey hunter myself, so I'm, I feel your pain on not uh, having the turkeys there that you, you used to have. And I want to talk about that a little bit more when it comes around <coughs> my time for questioning. but. Uh, I wanted to, um, especially the gentleman on the on the end, they both talked about early sectional habitat, the benefits of that to wildlife uh, and also to uh, water management. Uh, have you noticed a, uh, a dramatic increase in wildlife where there's been uh, active forest management in your uh, respective areas? Have you, or have you noticed any place where there's been active forest management that you haven't seen an increase in wildlife? Thank you, Congressman Westerman. I appreciate the question. Uh, Mark Lambrick, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. You know, the data that I presented, I th think, certainly supports uh, that at least elk uh, and diversity for other wildlife species has increased on early successional forest habitat 
uh, I think you all can also demonstrate that elk will redistribute to actively manage private lands when they can't find that habitat condition on public lands. So I'd say yes, that, that's a correct assumption. Mr. Ferguson, would you? You know, as a uh, former staffer in the Utah delegation, we used to regularly cite the Deseret Land and Livestock Operation. It's in northern Utah in uh, ranking member Bishop's District. Um, it, it's a world-renowned both uh, livestock operation but also a, a safe haven for wildlife. And so that, that's an example that, that immediately comes to mind for me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Lowenthal for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee members. Um, I'd like to ask some, just, just kind of go through. Uh, Ms. Chaithlok Sifsov? Yes, that's uh, correct. From your experience, are there concerns from Alaska Native communities about how climate change is going to, does already or will in the future, impact traditional and cultural uses of the land? Can you explain that in a little bit more depth? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, about uh, this is a rough figure, but about 82% of Alaskan communities, so that includes cities and rural communities, um, or 82% of all communities in Alaska are, are only accessible by boat or plane. And that means that everything from, from milk to eggs to vegetables has to be barged or flown in from somewhere else. So that's an economic uh, impact right there. If, if the wildlife population and the animal migrations and the salmon populations are all in fluctuation every year and unpredictable, that changes the viability of the commercial fishing salmon uh, economy out there. Um, we have huge peaks and huge diffs and trends that last uh, 10 years of, of no fish. And, um, and this is not economically viable for communities that rely on uh, subsistence hunting and uh, limited monetary uh, and capital in order to live. Um, so in terms of the wildlife and, and the attitude, um, indigenous populations uh, in these areas are connected to the environment in ways that are uh, too numerous to even piece out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, again, thank you for your testimony. I, I'm just wondering, what steps does an organization like yours take to ensure that recreational shooting doesn't start a man-made wildfire? So the National Shooting Sports Foundation is, is the trade association that represents manufacturers. They've got a campaign that they launch you know, each summer, each spring, especially at, at the height of fire season that speaks to best practices, the do's and don'ts, so to speak, of uh, shooting um, you know, in, in unplanned areas. One, one thing I would like to reference and thank Congress for passing the Target Range Enhancement Bill. This is a bill that gives state wildlife officials more flexibility to utilize Pittman-Robertson dollars for the construction of public shooting ranges. And we think that the more shooting that happens on uh, planned, organized ranges, it's a better outcome for shooters, for safety, and for other public land users. Thank you. Ms. Hutchinson, Hutchinson, uh, what does the threat of climate change mean for a family like yours that has built their livelihoods around the ability to access, to recreate, and to run a business that relies on public lands. Right. Well, in my fly shop, I employ guides and their families, but I also employ college kids and high school kids who have a hopeful future in the outdoor industry. And so for me, I see those multipliers as just going out, not just in our community, but you know, as I'm training them, I don't want to set them up to fail. You know, I want these kids to be able to go out there and be part of that nine, you know, nine, big $900 billion number that's so important. And in our state, it's a $7.1 billion industry in the outdoor industry. So I have a big stake in that. I feel like, you know, it's my responsibility as I'm training them to also safeguard their future, that this is something that they should even go into. Um, with a couple of those, you know, big numbers, it's 71,000 jobs including mine in our state alone. And these are jobs that kids don't just want,
but adults want too. I mean, we have a lot, you know, of people looking at this as, you know, either a career that they always wanted to have or a second career or something that now because they're able to understand this outdoor economy better is something that can sustain their families if we treat it properly. So it's something that, um, as you know, you guys all know, has been growing and, and continues to grow, especially since we had nearly three million people uh, visiting Glacier National Park last year. You know, that's a lot of service that needs to be provided to those. That's, that's a, you know, two million acres of wilderness around where I live all needs to be managed. So there's a lot of jobs there that are available. And I do feel an important responsibility kind of at the beginning of that um, to, to make sure that that's something that's viable for them in the future, for me in the future. And God, it worries the hell out of me when my kids say that they want to be a fishing guide. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, gosh, okay, well, let's, let's do what we can to make sure that the water's there in the future and that we have this competitive edge, that intact ecosystem is key. And, and I also, you know, wanted to address the, the ocean part of it too. I mean, that is a huge thing, the outdoor industry, and, and I do a fair amount of ocean fishing, and I think that that is a, a key element of the economy as well. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. C Ranking Member Curtis for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and once again, thanks to our witnesses for being here. When we talk about this issue, I have two strong regrets, and, and one of them is that we tend to talk about this as if there is a one-size-fits-all solution coming from the federal government that if we could just pass it, it would somehow solve all of this. And the second is that no matter what somebody's efforts are, they're not enough. Um, and uh, no matter how much somebody tries and, and improves and, and does this, it's just never really enough. So uh, along those lines, Mr. Ferguson, you, you said a couple of things in your testimony I'd like to, to go back to. Uh, one was just the efforts of your company. And, and I'd like to personally take a minute and thank you uh, for those efforts. I think too frequently we don't recognize uh, substantial efforts made by individuals and by corporations towards solving this. So, so thank you uh, and, and to all of you who, who make efforts and, and work on this. The second thing is this acknowledgement that the role of not just the federal government, but state governments, municipalities, and individuals is critically important if we're going to solve this, and that we can't just depend on the federal government to pass this mythical law that we just can't seem to find. And Mr. Ferguson, you were bold enough, you testified before Congress that you accepted the Clean Air Challenge, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pin you down a little bit on that. For those of you that don't know, it's a challenge I've introduced back at home and here in Congress, and, and uh, Chairman Holland was actually quick to jump on it and accept it herself, and that is that we'll, we'll personally do things to change our lifestyle. So, Mr. Ferguson, here in front of the Congress, are you doing a better job at carpooling? Well, my, my wife is proud of me, so our gym is about a mile away. And so now, instead of driving to the gym, I you know, get up off the couch and I run there. So that's been probably the biggest lifestyle change, and it's actually been a pretty good one. Good. And are you idling less? Idle, absolutely. Good. There's a number of things, and, and, and this is my point, is I believe much of the solution to this lies in hundreds and thousands of small actions by individuals that, that are just too frequently discounted. Uh, with, along with more gym time, it's less Chick-fil-A <laughs> time. <laughs> so all in all, it's, it's good. Um, along with this is this concept of, um, of state and local governments. When I was the mayor of Provo, we created the Provo Clean Air Toolkit. And I'm really proud that that is now going statewide. And we'll have the Utah Clean Air Toolkit, which is a, a simple nuts and bolts, what individuals can do, families, businesses, corporations can all do to, to improve the environment. And, and I'm hopeful that we can not lose sight of the individual responsibility we have. Yes, Congress has some responsibility, but I think it's hypocritical of us if we're not first individually doing what we can all do uh, first. Um, also, Mr. Ferguson, let me, you, you've mentioned Pittman-Robertson. Um, your company's donated $80 million to that. Can you talk for just a minute about how the connection between improving the health of forests and wetlands and grassland, grasslands and deserts and sage flats are connected to climate change? Sure, and, and just to clarify, the, we've paid about an average of $80 million per year, at least over the last four I years. just once, thank you. Um, you know, so we, we don't have great data on the Pittman-Robertson uh, contribution to carbon sequestration. I mentioned there's 76 million acres. But over at USDA, within the Conservation Reserve Program, we know that in 2012, there was about 30 million of acres of land enrolled in the Conservation Reserve Program. And, and those acreage uh, were, were collectively taking about 49 million metric tons of carbon out of the air, which was the equivalent of 10,000 uh, cars per year. 
So as you look at Pittman-Robertson, and you know, we're clearly more than double that figure, it, it, can, it can provide a substantial impact. Thank you, and I, I know we're getting close to votes, so I'm gonna yield my time to allow for more member questioning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ranking Member Curtis. And, and now would be a good time for me just to remind us all that the uh, Dingle Act that just passed and was signed into law supports climate action through land conservation. So I, uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. DeGette for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I really want to thank you for holding this hearing today, which is so important to all of us, and particularly those of us uh, from states like Colorado, where we have so many wonderful public lands. Um, uh, and, and these lands are important to all of us in Colorado. I'm a fourth generation Coloradoan. Um, but um, with population demands and growth, uh, co the conservation becomes even more important and of course with climate change pushing on us. And Coloradoans all think this. Um, my alma mater, Colorado College, every year does a poll, the co Conservation in the West poll. And this year we just got the 2019 um, results which demonstrated that land conservation and recre recreation are overwhelmingly supported by large majorities of Coloradoans while oil and gas development is, is not high on their list. In Colorado, over 83% of the residents believe it's important to protect and restore the health of rivers, lakes, and streams. 73% say the ability to live near, recreate on, and enjoy public lands like national forests, parks, or trails is the key reason they live in the West. And, and you'll be happy to know, Mr. Ferguson, 90% feel that the outdoor recreation economy is important for the future of our state and the Western United States. Now, on the other hand, only 24% of the respondents thought that more oil and gas drilling and mining was a good idea. And I think as the threat of climate change on these public lands continues to grow, we need to make sure we preserve these areas for future generations. Um, this is the commercial part of my speech because as the chair knows, I recently reintroduced the Colorado Wilderness Act, which will protect these pristine landscapes for generations to come. Um, I do have a couple of questions for the panel. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I think, um, um, I, Mr. Dubell, let me start with you. Can you talk about the importance of land conservation um, in protecting our natural carbon sinks, which can include forests, wetlands, and grasslands? I certainly can. In, in New Mexico, um, we've got the Permian Basin, which contains an incredible amount of fossil fuel that the, the extraction industries would, would obviously like to extract from the landscape. And I think we're, we're re recognizing and realizing in New Mexico, finally, as I mentioned in the testimony with the Office of Outdoor Recreation, that when we're talking about economic impact to the state, we really need to be thinking about it on a sustainable level. We need to be thinking about sustainability, which outdoor recreation is. And the New Mexico Wildlife Federation is, is very proud to be working closely with the Colorado Wildlife Federation as we're working on protections in the upper Rio Grande corridors and areas around Rio Grande del Norte. And the extraction industries have an impact on wildlife. In the northwest part of the state, oil and gas wells are affecting mule deer migrations. Uh, in the Permian Basin I was mentioning, our, our lesser prairie chickens are critically endangered at this point. And so, uh, again, outdoor recreation, I think, is, is a phenomenal solution. It's one we're working, working hard to continue to promote. How, how, um, how uh, you had testified before that one of the most important things we can do is to fully fund the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Why is that important? The Land and Water Conservation Fund provides us with the ability, with the financial ability to purchase tracts of land and protect those tracts of land and keep them natural, keep them wild. In New Mexico, one great example of this was the Valles Caldera National Preserve. This was a, a large property. It's often referred to as the Yellowstone of the Southwest. When that property went up for sale, had it not been for the funds provided by Land and Water Conservation Fund, it could have been purchased by developers, it could have been purchased by extraction industry, it could be mined, it could be a condominium with Sir, a golf course around thank, there. Thank you very much. I, I just have a quick question for Ms. Chaitheth Luxisoff. Was that close enough? That <laughs> um, was pretty as, as I know that you're a, um, mm. a uh, s snowboarder, and I, I, I want you to tell me very quickly what impacts devastating climate change will have on our winter sports economies throughout the United States and in particular in the West. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much for the question. Um, yeah, so, so it's a multifaceted uh, situation, um, and it seems to every stage of these facets uh, create another problem. So uh, it begins with the lack of snowfall, and uh, it's mitigated by increased snow farming, uh, which requires technologies like snow cats to be upgraded, um, made uh, in order to maneuver and gather snow. Um, it, it, it requires uh, increased production of fake snow, which it requires uh, increased output uh, for resorts to buy those uh, machineries, uh, which then creates a need for man hours to operate those machineries, which then creates an increase in ticket prices and sales to the point where now it's pretty rare to find a ski ticket underneath $100, thank if you. not Th $100. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Westerman for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you again to the witnesses. Uh, Mr. DeBell, I want to go back to your, your comments about uh, weather changes in New Mexico, seeing drier conditions, less, I think you said, no water, <coughs> no turkeys. Um, and, you know, as we look at these issues, I think we all are on the same page that we want to see better uh, conservation of our lands and our water. We want to see better wildlife habitat. We want to see better recreational uh, opportunities out there. And I'm, I'm sure if you've studied the, the science behind climate change that, you know, it's, it's well known that uh, climate change takes decades or, or even centuries or millennia. And we see a lot of weather changes uh, in between uh, when the climate changes. So one, one thing, I've, I went back and looked for New Mexico on average precipitation oh, since uh, 1901, and you can see there's a lot of variation in uh, precipitation. You see years like 1941 where there was over 26 inches of precipitation, and then just 15 years later in 1956 there was less than, than 8 inches, and we see little many trends going up and many trends going down. Um, but the bottom line is we've got to be good stewards of, of the water uh, that is there. And, you know, when we look at the science, there's a, a project that's been going on for some time out in, uh, uh, in Idaho. It's called the Micah Crick Experiment. Uh, this study was done by the University of Idaho that shows uh, exactly how uh, active forest management not only can provide better uh, quantities of water, but better quality of water, particularly in areas where you have steep slopes and, and snowfall. And Madam Chair, without objection, I would like to submit these two uh, documents for the record. Without objection. So when we, we, we know the science says that uh, managing forests is not only good for wildlife habitat, it's also good for water uh, conservation. And uh, we talked about the Dingle Conservation Act, and I would point out that, that conservation and preservation are not the same thing, but I'd just like to go down the, the row and see if you all agree that we should be doing active forest management based on scientific uh, uh, principles uh, to improve water uh, conservation and wildlife conservation. Does anybody disagree with doing active forest management for those purposes, Mr. DeBell? Uh, I, I definitely agree that we need to be engaged in active, active forest management practices. I think that those practices need to be driven by the best available science. I agree. I agree. I'm not equipped to comment on that. Thank you, though. I live in an active timber harvest community, and I can tell you that um, the foresters and the timber harvesters, loggers that I know and respect and appreciate um, are very intent on maintaining uh, the highest level of environmental protections regulations and doing the right thing before you know, they, they consider that as an important part of their job first and not something that should be looked at after. And uh, they, they definitely, in my um, observation of them, know that they don't want to compromise environmental responsibility for political expediency. Good, good answer. I think you will find that ac across the country. Certainly true in my district in Arkansas as well. Thank you for the question, Congressman Westerman. In my remarks, I stated the three habitat needs of elk were food, water, and cover. And elk, the science demonstrates, will find those three habitat conditions in actively managed lands. 
And I'll reiterate, you know, our appreciation for the forest funding fix, but now the next, next phase is to get a bill, to get active management, a more comprehensive approach to the way we manage these forests to reduce catastrophic wildfire. I locked all those answers, Madam Chair, so I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Westerman. The chair now recognizes Mr. Huffman for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to the witnesses. It's been an interesting conversation. Um, just to touch on something that came up from my, my colleague, Mr. Heiss, uh, if any of my colleagues across the aisle ever want to work together on the Green New Deal, I'll be the first to, to reach out in your direction, and, and we will collaborate and make it happen. Uh, if you have other plans that are different ways of making progress on climate, I'll be delighted to work with you. But if we're just doing stunts to try to do things that seem like they may score political points, uh, it's not an honest uh, effort. Uh, and I would suggest that energy be redirected into actual policies and proposals instead of, instead of gimmickry. Now, um, Ms. Hutchison, uh, cold water fishing is near and dear to my heart, and so uh, I enjoy uh, hearing from you and, and other folks in your industry. And I know we must have a lot of, uh, a lot of members of Congress who think, well, what's the big deal if we lose cold water fish habitat? Aren't there warm water fish that can uh, you know, sustain fishing jobs and recreational activity. But cold water fishing is different. Yeah. Um, and those temperature thresholds are really critical. I've seen in my district massive fish die-offs in the Klamath River, for example, as a result of changes in those temperature thresholds and some of the water quality degradation that comes along with water, uh, higher temperatures, algal blooms and parasites and diseases. Uh, and, and it can be devastating. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about the uniqueness and the importance of hanging on to cold water fish and right. what they represent. Thank you for your question, and I just love this kind of stuff. This is where I start to nerd out, so bear with me. The, the cold water fisheries in many situations are linked directly to what I refer to as that competitive edge in Glacier, which is that fully intact ecosystem. So we have all native trout at the crown of the continent there. That means we don't have rainbow trout and we don't have brown trout, which are non-native and have been introduced. Um, a lot of times people like to fish for those, and there are plenty of places to fish for them now you know, all over the planet. Um, when you have cold water fishery that's specific to harboring native bull trout, native cutthroat trout, um, grayling, whitefish, these, these fish that have been recorded for generations, 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 you have a strong intact ecosystem. When they start to hybridize with non-native fish, the way the cutthroat are hybridizing with the rainbow, then that strain becomes weaker and weaker after every time that um, they have a new generation of fish. And then that fish doesn't have the history of being able to sustain since the beginning of time like cutthroat have, and then that ecosystem starts to fall apart. So what we're seeing with climate change is that those hybridization opportunities are happening more frequently because those hardier non-native fish right. are able to move up into the system. Yeah. Thank you for that. Wild and scenic river protection is an important way to, uh, to hang on to these, these resources. Right. Could you speak to that? Because I've got a bill in Northwest California that designates some wild and scenic rivers, and yeah. we think that's a good thing for the recreational economy and for um, these unique environments. Sure. Fewer than one quarter of 1% of our nation's rivers have that wild and scenic river designation. And the importance of it, you can see where I live, because we're lucky enough in my immediate area to have four. And what we see there is economic vibrance based on that outdoor economy. You're still able to do all of these outdoor recreation things. It's not cut off, and it benefits economically and then keeps that ecosystem intact for sure. Thank you. M Mr. Dubel, um, we had a, a devastating report from the uh, Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform uh, on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services uh, last week, I believe. Uh, some sobering news about a million plant and animal species on the verge of extinction as part of this mass uh, wave of extinctions, uh, driven in large part by climate change. Um, talk about how protection of wilderness areas and wild and scenic river designations and other uh, wildlife refuges, other uh, places that are uh, strongholds of biodiversity, is important to uh, serving both the needs of recreation and wildlife in the face of climate change. That's a great question. So the, the number one greatest threat to wildlife populations in New Mexico and across the country is loss of habitat, habitat destruction. 
and wilderness designations and other land protections like wild and scenic river designations are, are critical tools that we can use to protect large scale landscapes. I mentioned in the testimony as well that migration corridors are very important and a lot of work's being done around that space and, and connectivity and identifying and studying how wildlife move through the landscape. And for many years, the presence of human development have fragmented wildlife habitat and populations. And so our, lar our opportunities for large scale public land protections are diminishing and we need to take action now and do everything possible to protect these lands. The New Mexico Wildlife Federation was founded in 1914 by Aldo Leopold. Hmm. Aldo Leopold is, is the, the, yep. the reason we have wilderness and we don't have enough of it. And if we had more of it, I think that report we saw last week would have been a little more positive. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Huffman. The chair recognizes Mr. Nagoose for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for holding this uh, important hearing on an issue that's certainly uh, dear to my heart, uh, as I know as many of my colleagues, uh, and is incredibly important to the economy, uh, the health, and the recreation of those from my home state of Colorado uh, and my district, the second congressional district, uh, which includes Boulder, Fort Collins, and our central mountains, some of the best uh, places uh, to ski in the United States, uh, Vail and Breckenridge and Winter Park and, and so forth. Uh, Colorado, Coloradans, I should say, are adamant supporters of our nation's public lands. Uh, every year, 71% of Colorado residents participate in outdoor recreation activities, uh, from hiking to camping to skiing to mountain biking. Our state provides endless opportunities uh, to recreate and enjoy the beauty of Colorado. Uh, however, these out outdoor opportunities are contingent on lands being available to all of us. And so that's why I uh, would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity uh, to mention uh, in January uh, the piece of legislation that I introduced with Senator Michael Bennett, uh, the Colorado Outdoor Recreation and Economy Act, H.R. 823, which would preserve approximately 400,000 acres of Colorado's beautiful landscapes to ensure that folks from all places and walks of life can enjoy the physical and mental benefits of spending time uh, in nature. Uh, I do want uh, to ask uh, some questions of uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Chethluk Sifswaf. I hope I pronounced that right. Close. Yeah, that was great. It's phonetic. Oh, all right. That's wow, you guys all right. are all doing Terrific. well. So. Mine's a tough one with yeah. Nagoose. So, uh, <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I represent Colorado's second district, which uh, includes several of the nation's world-class ski and snow sport uh, resorts, uh, which I'm sure you've been to. Uh, and it is no surprise that access to these recreation opportunities is what attracts many of my constituents to live where they do. Uh, they firmly believe in the value and protection of our public lands, uh, as I believe. Congresswoman DeGette uh, previously mentioned 90% of Coloradans prefer that Congress emphasize public land protection and recreational ac access over increasing energy extraction on public lands. Uh, but unfortunately, in my view, that is certainly not the direction the Trump administration is setting for our nation. Uh, and so I guess I am curious from your point of view, how do you believe the inaction of the current administration might, uh, regarding climate change might impact the future of the outdoor recreation industry? I think that's an excellent question. Thank you so much. And um, uh, actually, I think it's pertinent to bring up the uh, point that was made earlier um, about the difference between uh, individual impact and uh, corporate impact and governmental impact. Um, and that's a, that's a big difference, and I think the numbers are swayed far more heavily towards corporate interests, and uh, that being the cause of uh, increased uh, effects of climate change as opposed to the individual uh, um, actions. And I think that can be backed up by uh, Yale Connection and many different studies. Um, and so for me, ultimately, uh, what I see is that it's great to have sentiment. Uh, we all individually care about our passions and our, our livelihoods um, and then our cultures. But in the grand scheme of things, uh, the way that we've been operating as a as a government is not feasible, and uh, science tells us that it will not uh, curb the effects of climate change. Uh, I also, uh, you know, I unfortunately missed uh, your um, oral testimony, but did review your written testimony, and uh, you mentioned in the recent Winter Olympic Games, this may have come up already, but that snow had to be either made or transported to places hosting the games. Um, I am just, I'm kind of curious how does man-made snow differ from natural snow, and what are the drawbacks uh, for snow sports? Uh, thank you for that question. So um, specifically for the half pipe, um, which many of you guys have probably seen, uh, that needs very specific snow in order to hold its shape. And then over time, 
uh, every time you go on it. It's a whole kind of science in and of itself, but uh, the quality of snow is very important um, to injuries, uh, to the way that the sport even functions. Um, and then, of course, um, helicoptering in uh, snow is not an uh, economically viable solution. Um, but the man-made snow, I'm sure, coming from Colorado, by, na by this time, it's a, it's a constant. And more often than not, you're skiing on man-made snow. Um, it's coarser. Um, and in general, you know, that, that's a very small, minor thing, but the economics of that are quite great. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I would just uh, echo the sentiments of my uh, distinguished colleague from California, Representative Huffman, and, and associate myself with his remarks that, uh, you know, to the extent that we can partner with our colleagues on the other side of the aisle to call attention to the need to act on climate change, uh, just as fishing is dear to his heart and uh, certainly the snow sports uh, certainly dear to mine. I think there are a lot of opportunities to highlight the ways in which climate change is drastically impacting our way of life, and I would hope that we could unite around some solutions. So with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Nagus. The chair now recognizes Mr. Tonko for five minutes, and it looks like they're calling votes, but um, please, we'll have time for you. Thank you, Chairwoman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today on what is an important topic. I chair Energy and Commerce's subcommittee on environment and climate change. And so I would just state that, as we all know, the threats of climate change are very real. Uh, we understand that humans are driving it and that we need to build solutions that meet the scale and urgency of the crisis that we all face. Climate change not only threatens American lives and our environment, but it also threatens our resources, public lands, and indeed our economy. I'm concerned about how climate change will impact health and safety as well as the, country, uh, the, as the economy across my home state and across the country. Uh, studies have shown that temperatures in New York may rise by as much as 9 degrees Fahrenheit by 2080. Rising temperatures are causing uh, marine species to shift an average of 50 miles north and are placing cold water fisheries at risk. These temperature rises, along with the declining snowpack, are leading to shorter winter sports seasons. In New York alone, these shorter seasons are expected to lead to economic losses of up to $500 million a year. Our inaction is risking the future of our public lands. The outdoor recreation economy, which largely relies on these lands, is also under threat. We have a responsibility to protect these places and ensure that they are part of the climate change conversation. By ensuring that we set up safeguards that limit the impacts of climate change, we are investing certainly in our country. So I would ask you, Ms. Sipsoff, as a former Olympic athlete, You've had the chance to compete on a world stage alongside athletes from hundreds of countries, all with unique backgrounds, stories, and obstacles that had to be overcome in order to compete at that given level. The Olympics are held in the spirit of competition, and they certainly promote uh, pride in one's country. But it is also an opportunity to connect, collaborate, and forge consensus with other competitors and countries. Today, nearly every country on Earth has an opportunity to send athletes to participate in the Olympics, rivaling few international gatherings in terms of uh, those represented. Much like the Olympics, the Paris Climate Agreement had nearly universal participation from countries around the world, and the U.S. withdrawing from this agreement, much like a country withdrawing from the Olympics, sends a political message to our partners and competitors around the world. Are you concerned that the U.S. is sending the wrong message by withdrawing from the Paris Agreement and curtailing our own domestic policies intended to support those climate goals? Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, throughout that, everything you said about the Olympics is, is true, and, uh, and I was privileged enough to attend the Global Climate Action Summit uh, along with Protect Our Winners. Um, and, uh, and it was a privilege to witness um, on a global scale, the promises and the, um, the uh, really complex conversations that were being held there um, and the power with which um, action on a global scale felt to me. Um, and then it, it was uh, after, after attending, I kind of quickly was awakened to the fact that, that, um, that this is impossible unless America also joins in. And, uh, and so, you know, it, it's, it is imperative that we do this on a, on a larger scale and, and a federal level. Um, it's, it's important to every single person on the planet, and that's not hyperbole. Right. And I take it that uh, you've seen value in bringing 
people together and countries together around the world in pursuit of common goals? Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, we, on the Olympic uh, circuit, um, it looks like it's kind of a random group of athletes, but you actually make and forge connections uh, across sports, across, uh, um, across country lines. Um, and, uh, and it really is truly a, a camaraderie and, a, and a, a family globally. And so I, I really do, um, I appreciate that and, and would love to see that govern in the government Thank you. form. Thank you. And Ms. Sifsoff, in your testimony, you stated that the consequences of climate change are not simply environmental. Um, can you elaborate on that statement and what are some of the non-environmental impacts of climate change that you have seen? Yeah, thank you. When I get into this kind of stuff, uh, I cut a lot of it from my testimony um, because it gets kind of boring. But essentially, uh, one good example is the cloudberry of uh, my culture. And the cloudberry is a unique berry to the Arctic Circle. Um, very, very, very uh, uh, sensitive plant. And my culture operates uh, every year in observation, in constant observation of, of the behaviors around our villages in order to harvest it and to have forethought for the next uh, seasons ahead so that there's continued abundance. And, um, and so that's just a very, very micro way in which um, communities in Alaska um, are surrounded and immersed by their environment. Um, and as far as culturally, um, you know, there's so many economic numbers, there's, and this is, when I talk about my personal culture and the loss of culture, um, it's emotionally charged and, uh, and it affects all of Alaska. It affects a, a, a really well-known example would be the Iditarod, um, and uh, the Iditarod has continuously uh, faced difficulty even uh, being able to be held because of a lack of snowfall. Um, but that's actually a cultural practice, and so, um, and so, over time, these these ab abilities to utilize the environment around us in the many many different ways that we're required in order to um, to live out in rural areas, um, we're slowly seeing them go away. And thank thank you so much. I'm sorry, Mr. Tonka, your time back. has expired. Thank you so much for all of your valuable testimony. I'm very grateful and, and, and uh, appreciative of all of you being here today, and also the members for all their questions. The members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to these in writing. Under Committee Rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit witness questions within three business days following the hearing and the hearing record will be open for 10 business days for these responses, and I will submit my questions in that manner. Uh, I'm sorry, we have votes, so we need to get to the Capitol. Uh, and so if there's no further business, without objection, the committee stands adjourned, and I thank you all so much again. easy to find. Good. Hey, do you know uh, any good North Fork shuttlers? Oh, totally. I've got, I've got one. Um, it's called Shore Thing Shuttle. Good, because the last one I that? used trashed my trailer. Stop it. Yeah. How? Yeah, I don't know. They must have driven down that road 100 miles an hour. Because by the time I got to the takeout, uh, the whole right axle was just gone. No. Yeah, so I had to limp into Columbia Falls and get oh some emergency welding gosh. done. And I'm so sorry. <laughs> Oh, no. Yeah, that was a... Did you, were you able good. to track them down and speak with them? Uh, you know, actually, the, uh, it, it was that uh, outfit out of the uh, Old Bridge place. And they just, they said they sent some guy that they knew. And I didn't go with a reputable deal.